Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. In my opinion, the secret to solving this question is to take a very long pause at the comma, because we should be able to make a significant inference there about the range within which n must live on the number line. And I think in this case, it's obvious that we should draw a number line because they literally said number line in that sentence. So here I draw a number line, and I'm going to put 0 somewhere there, and I know that n lives to the left of that. But I also know that the square of n, let's write this down, so n squared is less than 1 over 100. And we know that this is a house arrest type of situation. We would translate it, I'll put it down here, uh, absolute value of n is less than 1 over 10. What I did is I took the square root of both sides, and I put an absolute value around the unknown because it's an unknown. We don't know which side of 0 it came from. Of course, in this case, we do know, but I'm pretending I don't know that yet. n must be located less than one-tenth of a unit from 0. So it's, it has to remain at zero or within one-tenth of a unit from zero. That's why I think of it as a house arrest. I'm imagining N wearing a, an ankle bracelet and the police get alerted if N goes one-tenth of a unit away from zero or more. Now, we know that N is to the left of zero, so that means that N lives somewhere in this range between negative one-tenth and zero. That's where N lives. It's very important to make that full inference at the comma. Because if I keep reading, then it's just going to be harder for me to make that inference. So we talk a lot about that. With word problems, you, you have to pause and infer as you go. Otherwise, you're just making your life much harder than it needs to be. So I know that n lives somewhere in here. Now, unfortunately, the question is not about n. The question is about the reciprocal of n. So now we have to think about what happens to a negative fraction. We know that n is some negative fraction between 0 and negative 1 tenth. What happens to such a negative fraction when you flip it, when you take the reciprocal of that fraction? And uh, the answer is it's still going to be on the left side of 0 because the, the sign doesn't change. But it's going to be much farther from zero. When you, when you take a fraction that's pretty close to zero and you flip it, it's going to be farther away. And isn't it true that the closer the fraction is to zero, the farther away from zero the reciprocal would be? So based on that, can we pick out the right answer? Like where would the reciprocal of n be if we know that it's, it's closer to zero than negative one-tenth? And the reciprocal of negative 1 tenth is negative 10. And we know that the closer we are to 0, the farther away from 0 would be the reciprocal. Is that enough to pick out the right answer? Less than minus 10. That's right. Now, let's say that that last part was hard for you. Is there some trick that you could use to make it easier? And the answer is yes, there is a trick. You could think of any number inside that range, so what's a number that's in between negative one-tenth and zero? And I would probably minus think Minus one of, by 12. Yeah, so, so minus one over 12 is great. Personally, I would have thought of minus one over 20. Either way, right? And you take the reciprocal of that and you ask, which of these answer choices would that reciprocal live in? And the answer would be A. Whether you took negative one over 12, then it would be negative 12. If you took negative 1 over 20, it would be negative 20. Either way, you're to the left of negative 10, and that's how you can get the answer. A ratio represents how many times the denominator fits inside the numerator. It's connected to the point which I make in the book about why dividing by 0 is undefined. When you divide by very small fractions, then you're essentially talking about 
how many times can I fit that small fraction into whatever your numerator is? All right, so for example, mm -hmm. one over one over a million is describing how many times can you fit this teeny tiny fraction into one unit on the number line? And the answer would be, well, I can fit that teeny tiny fraction a million times into one unit on the number line. And that, that's why dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. Right? So you would say uh -huh. one, over, one over a million is a million. And so that's the logic there. And if we divide by an even smaller fraction, let's say dividing by one over a billion, I'll just write it as 10 to the power of uh, one over 10 to the power of nine. And you ask how many times can I fit an even teenier fraction, right? One over a billion, that's minuscule. That's infinitesimally small. How many times can I fit that fraction inside one unit? A billion times. And if you divide by zero, what are you asking? You're asking, how many times can I fit a length of zero, so a length that doesn't actually exist, how many times can I fit that inside some length on the number line? Whatever you, in this case, the numerator is one, so inside one unit. But whatever that, un, whatever that numerator is, you're asking, how many times can I fit zero into that space? And that's a nonsensical question. I guess the answer would be infinity. Like I can fit zero infinity times and into whatever the space is. But that's, is that even right? Like, is that the correct answer? I can fit zero infinity times into the space? I don't think that's right either, because it's, it's a space that doesn't even exist in the denominator. And I think that's why we say that it's undefined. Dividing by zero is undefined. So I think that your question, JD, is related to this. I think if you really think deeply about why dividing by zero is undefined in the context of a number line, then you also realize that the closer you are to zero, the farther from zero your reciprocal would be. And the reason why zero is so important in this conversation is because with multiplicative reasoning, which ratios is a part of, it's all about your distance from zero. Whereas with additive reasoning, the first part of the book, the, the specific position of zero is irrelevant. It's not interesting at all with additive reasoning, because there you're just adding or subtracting known amounts, known quantities on the number lines. You're just going to move up or down the number line in a very predictable manner. But when you're multiplying or dividing, your actual movement depends on how far away from zero you were to begin with. Right? If I triple some number, how far will it move? Uh, which direction will it move? I don't know. It depends on its position relative to zero. Uh, mm -hmm. A multiplicative operation operates on the number's distance from zero. An additive operation just operates on the number. It doesn't care where zero is. So that's why the specific position of zero is so important when you're talking about ratios, because it's how many times can I fit the distance of the denominator from zero inside the distance of the numerator from zero. That's what a ratio is, essentially, in the context of a number line. So it's all about just distances don't. from zero. My advice there is just think about the midpoint. Because you know the midpoint between negative one-tenth and zero is going to be somewhere within that range. How would you find the midpoint? Do you have a system to find the midpoint of two points on the number line? Just divide by two. Yeah, the, the system, if you want to call it that, is to take the average. The average of any two points on the number line is the midpoint of those two points. Now, how do we find the average of two points? Add them and divide by two. Now, in this case, one of them is zero, so you're right. You could just divide by two, and that would give you the midpoint. But maybe but that's, that's why I thought of negative one over 20, because I was thinking about the midpoint. It didn't occur to me until just now, but that's probably why that's the number that popped into my head. Subconsciously, I was wondering about the midpoint of that range. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below. And give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. All right, let's talk about this question. I, I think a lot of people would uh, probably build an equation for the free info. They'd say A plus P plus M equals 1500. And then they would ask, somehow they would ask which of those three variables is the greatest. I think that's okay. I think maybe a better way to think about it is to draw a number line 
that has a total of 1500 and then we have that broken into three segments and we don't know which is which of course but and now I'll just put A, P, and M there. And this is just a visual way for me to kind of ask myself, which of these segments is greatest? I personally prefer that to a, an equation, but uh, to each his own. And I think an equation is fine. We want to know which of these letters goes with, with the biggest segment, essentially. Now, I think you'll agree that statement two is much easier to evaluate. So let's start with statement two. Statement two implies that M is 450, so I know that much, and then I can infer that the other two add up to 1050. Now, before we read statement two, we could have said that any of them could have had the longest segment. The answer could be A, the answer could be P, the answer could be M. Does this statement eliminate any of those three options? That's the purpose of a statement, right? The, the statement is supposed to narrow down the field of possibilities in the context of what the question was asking. And so does statement two narrow down that field for us at all? That's right. Statement two implies that M is not the answer. So it, it removes one of the three options. But Marsha can't possibly be the highest if she covered less than one third of the distance. Because however way you play the other two, I mean, with the other two, you can think about the extremes. One extreme is that one of them did the entire remaining distance and the other didn't drive at all. In the other extreme, they shared half and half of the distance. Either way, Marsha mm -hmm. is not winning. But between A and P, we still don't know which is greater. So let's go ahead and eliminate the answer traces that claim that statement two is sufficient on its own. So B and D are gone. We know that M was not the winner, but we don't know who was the winner, A or P. Not sufficient. How do we think about statement one? That's a much harder statement to evaluate. We know that Al drove longer, but slower. So, th so of the two, Al drove longer, but slower. I guess the first question we should ask is, can this statement be sufficient on its own? I mean, the answer has to be no, because we don't know anything about Marsha. So with statement one on its own, there's no chance of being able to answer this question. I'm eliminating A as an option. Now, I kind of wish that statement one said that whoever drove longer was also driving faster. Because if you're driving both longer and faster, then you're covering more distance. So if I make two little changes here, make this and and make this faster with these two changes then the correct answer would be C because statement 2 lets us know that either Al or Pablo is the winner and statement 1 tells us that between the two Al covered more distance because he was driving longer and was faster if the same person who drove longer also drove faster than that person drove the greatest distance. But in this case, unfortunately, the person who drove more time drove slower. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, is there some way, using statement one, to figure out who drove a greater distance, Al or Pablo? And I think one way to convince ourselves that it's impossible to tell is by drawing a xy coordinate plane. We've done this once before for a, a speed and distance question and you could call this time and this speed or vice versa, doesn't really matter, but the area underneath the, the, the graph will be the, the distance traveled, right? So if we say, you know, the faster speed goes with a shorter time, and then the slower speed goes with a faster time. So uh, Pablo was the faster driver, right? so this would be P, and then Al is this. So you can see visually that the part that we have to make a determination on is this rectangle here at the top compared to this rectangle here on the right, and we need to figure out which is bigger. And what do we know? 
we know that this is one hour, and we know that this is five miles per hour, but we can't compare the rectangles because we don't know anything about this. We're lacking context. I don't know if an hour is a lot or a little in the context of how long they were driving for. I don't know if five miles per hour is a big difference or a small difference in the context of how fast they were going. I mean, are they, uh, it says that they're driving, right? So I know that they're not riding a bicycle and they're not walking or running. So there's, you know, so it's at least, let's say 20 miles per hour because they're driving. Uh, but there's also cars that can drive 150 miles per hour. And if they're driving at 150 miles per hour, then a five mile per hour difference is not that much. It's practically the same speed at those high speeds. But at 20 miles per hour, a five mile per hour difference is very significant. So it goes back again to this conceptual difference between additive reasoning and multiplicative reasoning. With an additive change, uh, you, you're lacking context. You don't know whether that additive piece is, uh, is significant or not because you don't know the context. You don't know how far away from zero you were, you were to begin with. And that's why I'm convinced that it's impossible to tell who drove a greater distance, Al or Pablo, and therefore the correct answer is E. It is a difficult statement, and it's something that the GMAT really loves to test. This idea that when you're talking about multiplicative reasoning, I should also explain why this is multiplicative reasoning. Uh, the reason it's multiplicative reasoning is because distance equals rate times time. And there's the multiplicative part of the multiplicative reasoning. So it's a multiplicative reasoning context, but statement one is only giving you additive changes without the context. And that is a concept that I see tested in the GMAT all the time. And if you don't understand that conceptual point that we're talking about here, then uh, that's when people run out of time on the test, because they start testing cases to try to prove insufficiency. And if you're doing that, you're already off to a bad start, right? That's, that's just not what the question was designed for. And it's not going to be under two minutes if you do that. So uh, important lesson here that's uh, useful in a lot of different GMAT questions. The only way they could do it is by, well, I guess there's two ways. One I mentioned, right? One was this change where the, the person who drove more time was also the faster person. Then you could conclude for sure that that person covered more distance. The other way that I can think of that they could make it sufficient is by giving context. So if they told you how long one of them actually drove, then you would be able to infer the speeds because you also know that they covered a total of 1,050 miles, and you know that the difference in speeds was five miles per hour, and you know one drove an hour longer than the other, and you know how long that was. So then you could infer everything you wanted to infer. But they would have to find some way to give you context. Another way they could have given you context, and this would probably be even harder, is give a percent change. Al drove 20% more time than Pablo, but Al drove 10% slower than Pablo. There's a really, really important conceptual difference between this statement and the original statement one. The original statement one gave us the differences using additive reasoning. It gave them as, as actual differences. This statement is giving us the differences as ratios, multiplicative reasoning. That makes an enormous difference conceptually. Because here I can say, if I compare uh, Al to Pablo, right, so we have speed, we have time, and we have distance. And then we can say the following. In terms of speed, Al is uh, slower, ratio of 9 to 10. In terms of time, Al drove longer, it's 12 to 10, or you know 6 to 5. And then we can say that it, the ratio of their distances would be 54 to 50. So Al covered 8%, if you want, more distance than Pablo. So I hope you're all appreciating here the really important difference conceptually between additive reasoning and, and multiplicative reasoning.
So did anyone find a good place to pause on this word problem? What did you process there? I want to push you to think of possible values of x that would be interesting to look at and see if you can identify the two height, you know, this new thing that we just learned about, the two height, what would be the two height of x if x is some number? And what would be the two yeah. height of x if it was this other number? So what numbers would you use there for x just to help you wrap your head around what this means? Good, that's a, that's a great inference. Let me write that down. So the two height of odd numbers is zero. I'm writing it down just because we're having a lesson on it. Uh, when you're at the test center, I'm not saying you have to write it down, but I do think it's a good idea to just articulate it to yourself in your head. Mm -hmm. Just as you're trying to understand fully what the, what a two height, in what way could a two height be useful? Like, why is that even a mm -hmm. thing, you know? When you look at that first sentence in the word problem, can you identify any clues that you might want to be thinking about prime boxes. And I would say a second clue is that we're, they're talking about you know, a factor of x, and we know that one of the best tools we have in our toolbox for dealing with factors is a prime box. But the bigger clue, I agree, is the fact they have a prime to some power, and that looks a lot like the beginning of a prime box. Please write down for yourselves the prime boxes of 6, 12, 24, and 75. I just kind of chose those at random. And find the two height for each of them. How would we find the two height of each of these numbers? What should we look at? So the two height for that first number would be this, followed by this, yeah. this, and then for 75 we don't have any twos, so I guess the two height would be what? Zero. That's right. I'm curious, Eric, if, if this little exercise here you think has helped you better understand what two height means. And, and I think there are two important takeaways here that I want to articulate for all of you because they would be useful in a lot of other questions. I think takeaway number one is if you start reading a GMAT problem and you feel like you're having a bit of trouble digesting what they're saying, and then you think, well, maybe I should just keep reading the rest of the problem, and that will help me better understand what they were telling me in the beginning. The answer 99% of the time is, no, don't do that. If you keep reading, it'll just, make, it'll just be even harder. I think that's an important takeaway. So I would always rather take a longer pause to play around with and fully digest what they're uh, telling me before I keep reading especially if they're defining something new that I've never heard of before. You know, they love those questions where they say, this type of bracket around x means the greatest integer less than or equal to x. And then there's the other side of that. This, this type of bracket around x means the smallest integer greater or equal than x. And those are actual real things in, in real life. They're called the ceiling value and the floor value, also known as ceiling function and floor function, which I talk about in the book. People tend to kind of read that sentence and say, well, I don't really get it. Why don't I keep reading the rest of the question? And then I'll, be, I'll have a better understanding of it. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, and I think the second important takeaway that goes for literally every data sufficiency question that has free info is you have to take the time to fully utilize the free info before you go to the statements. Because if I go to these statements unprepared or underprepared, then it's pretty much game over at that point. Because that's where you start testing random cases and going over two minutes, and then your score drops in the end of the day. So really important takeaway there. I know we've talked about it in the past, but it's always worth repeating. When there's free info in data sufficiency, that is the most important thing on the computer screen. We need to fully utilize that before we go to the statements, if possible. And you know, we talked a bit about sentence correction in the beginning of the day. Uh, it's very similar in sentence correction. In sentence correction, the non-underlined text, the non-underlined text in the original sentence, is equivalent to the free info in data sufficiency. Think about that. If the free info and data sufficiency is the most important thing on the computer screen, which it is, 
then in sentence correction, the non-underlined text is the most important thing in the computer screen. Because the non-underlined text, that's the part that you know is true, and that will drive what the underlined text should look like. Of course, a lot of people uh, totally gloss over the non-underlined text because they're thinking, well, that's not the part being tested, so I don't really need to pay attention to that. And same goes for free info and data sufficiency. Like, okay, that's nice, but they don't really spend the time to think about it deeply. So, so I think those are two very important takeaways here. So now that we really understand what a two height is, does the prime box of K contain more twos than the prime box of M? That's how I rephrase this question. And I know that JD really likes my analogy about uh, jacket sizes at the store, the, the inventory of jackets at a store and, and You've got your size 2 jackets, your size 3 jackets, your size 5 jackets, your size 7 jackets, and so on for all the primes. So only the prime numbers are, are available jacket sizes. And uh, if we imagine that K is the inventory of one store and M is the inventory of the other store, we're asking, does the inventory of, uh, of K have more size 2 jackets than the inventory of, of M? So it's only concerned with the number of size 2 jackets. For all we know, the inventory of store M is way, way greater, but they don't have as many size 2 jackets. They could have a million size 3, size 5, size 7, size 11 jackets, etc., but they don't have as many size 2 jackets as store K, even though store K is maybe a much smaller store with much less inventory overall. And now we're ready for the statements. You see, as usual, that when you do a good job rephrasing the question and really understanding what they're asking, evaluating the statements doesn't take more than a few seconds. At least I hope it won't. Right? So statement one tells us who's bigger, but just because one of them is bigger than the other doesn't mean it has more twos in the prime box. We don't know anything about their prime boxes. So I eliminate the answer choices that claim that statement one is sufficient on its own. And what about statement two? So you've got some prime box dividing by some other prime box, and we're told that the result is even, which means that there's at least one two in the prime box of the result. There could be more stuff in there, but the one thing I know for sure that it has is a two. And this is the prime box of K, and this is the prime box of M. Now when we divide prime boxes, anything that can get reduced gets reduced. So however many twos we had there, and however many threes we had there, and however many fives we had there, and so on, gets reduced down here. Now the fact that the result is an integer implies that k is, first of all, at least as big as m. The fact that, it, that it's an even integer means that it's at least 2. So k is at least twice as big as m. Statement 2 implies that k is at least twice as big as M. So if you already know statement 2, does statement 1 add any value? Or would you be able to say, no, statement 2 implies statement 1. Of course K is bigger than M if we knew that K over M is at least 2. Because the smallest even integer, well the smallest even integer is negative infinity, but uh, the smallest even positive integer, since we know K and M are both positive, the smallest uh, positive even integer is 2. So statement 2 tells you that k is at least twice as far from 0 as m is. And if you knew that, then of course k is greater than m. And who remembers from section 2 of the book which answer choices that eliminates without even reading the question? When statement 2 implies statement 1? a and c are gone. So I'm going to go ahead and eliminate c just because of that observation. So we're down to two answer choices now. But as a few of you already mentioned, if you're still going to have at least one two after you've reduced everything that there was to reduce, that means that whatever number you had here, let's make it orange, is at least bigger by one than whatever number you had here. We'll call it green. Orange is greater than green by at least one. And this also takes us back to exponent rules. Remember that exponent rule that says that a to the power of x over a to the power of y is a to the power of x minus y? You can kind of see that in the visualization of the prime boxes above. 
So orange is at least one more than green if the ratio still has at least one two in it. I mean, you could think of it this way. This is equal to orange minus green. Orange minus green equals that yellow circle, whatever is in that yellow circle. Just think about how much better you'll feel on the test solving a question like that this way than testing random cases, which I think is the, uh, I guess, the alternative <laughs> approach that a lot of people would utilize. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.